Hello, I am Frederick van Amstel. I am a, currently assistant professor at Federal University of Technology, Paraná, working in the field of self-design and experience design. I've been also thinking and researching several topics related to contradictions that are accumulating in society and how design can harness these contradictions for promoting systemic change. One of these contradictions that I have dealt in the last five years in Brazil has been colonization. Colonization is a contradiction that is related to the oppression systems that colonization started. For example, racism, sexism, patriarchy, and uh, classism related to capitalism. Well, from this uh, standpoint, I watch and look and read and theorize about environmental issues always from the perspective of this uh, dialectical existential perspective. As if all these issues, they have been accumulating across histories, across centuries, they are now just coming to us in the sense of something that we cannot at least try to think or do something about it, but they are already with us, they are part of us, so we are part of these contradictions and we cannot look at them from a detached perspective and just say uh, now I am, don't have any more environmental issues, now we can fix it, we cannot solve them because these are much more complex than we think, they are ingrained into the way we are <laughs> and the way we are, the, our uh, being in the world is historically constructed from everything that society brings to us, from the work that ancestors have done for us to be here and to exist in this way. So let me propose with this uh, keynote to shift the perspective of environmental uh, issues of uh, climate crisis, climate change and so on. Instead, let's focus on existential threats. Let's focus on the real uh, motivation for addressing those things in politics. It's not just because the uh, maritime, the oceanic, the uh, all the living beings that live in the forest that we are now concerned about climate change. It's because it's coming to affect and threaten our existence, human beings. But it's not just about all human beings, because some human beings are, have already their existence safely secured through some unequal exchange systems that are based on capitalism, colonialism, and other systems of oppression that I mentioned before. The existential threats are much um, harsh on the people that have been historically oppressed. So there are some people that try to speak on behalf of the entire humanity as if this existential threat affected the entire humanity uh, equally, but that's not true. Because if we somehow protect against part of this threat, some people, usually the way we safeguard some people will affect and maybe put on threat on another people. That design uh, in the midst of this environmental crisis has tried to protect, try to safeguard, try to make sustainable those people that are already privileged to have those things at least the best available uh, sustainable design, they already had it <laughs> and they just get more of it or at least perfected them because these people were the people who could fund and who could pay and buy, purchase design services and products. Of course, there is a new movement for doing design without uh, expecting and depending on commercial uh, systems, but still, and th from a theoretical standpoint, design is pretty much still tied to trying to solve environmental issues by attacking only the um, uh, symptoms and not the causes of uh, this environmental crisis. And my question with this talk is, can we understand better this uh, environmental crisis if we frame it as a colonialist legacy? as something that colonialism started in our society. Well, I believe that we can advance much further the, the agenda of the sustainable design and also design research in general if we
decolonize uh, design. If we uh, join forces with all the decolonizing struggles in other fields of knowledge, in, in other societies, in nations that have started since the beginning of colonization, as soon as colonizers they um, arrived, they invaded the indigenous territories, then they started um, bringing what they called civilization to these people, destroying their livelihoods, destroying their relationships to nature, which was much more synergetic and that did not destroy uh, resources and depleted and made uh, uh, so many animals into extinctions. All of these um, bad achievements, they came from colonization. And it's Usually we think that design started with the Industrial Revolution, that's the traditional historical narrative, but if we pull it a bit earlier, then we can see that design was already ingrained into colonization itself, because design was essential for this change from the primitive accumulation of capital in mercantilist uh, early colonization models, like for example from Portugal and Spain, that brought uh, the colonizers to try to exploit as much as resources they could and accumulate those resources as primitive capital in their countries in the shape of gold or wood. They didn't reinvest the, the money, they didn't reinvest the gold, the materials to create uh, capital from capital, which was perhaps the beginning of capitalism. And this was pioneered by other countries in Europe, for example, uh, the United Kingdom and England, and uh, other countries over there, the, the Netherlands, they, they started to take this, this um, wealth extracted from colonies and uh, turn this into products that they could sell and produce in the mass massive scale, especially for, <laughs> to those who had a lot of accumulated uh, rich and wealthy uh, wealth like for example Portuguese and the Spanish they were the first uh, massive buyer purchaser consumers of the industrial revolution so colonialism opened up the possibility for uh, design uh, to be spread uh, through the world and it's not like the industrial revolution created opportunity for design it was colonialism and colonialism has this is based on this uh, um, ideology of differences between bodies. The colonizer body is superior, it has some more strength, more intellectual abilities, has a higher culture, and the colonized body is inferior, has a lower culture, or even is not even considered to be human. For example, does not have a soul, or it, it's not does not have a, good, a brain that is big enough, or has this or that size. All of these. Uh, um, arguments. They were ideologies based on religious principles or scientific principles that just justified colonization instead of really trying to understand the nature of these uh, different cultures and these different people and learn from them something that the colonizers that the Western society didn't have because they believed that they were inferior. Nothing from the colonies could affect, change or improve uh, the metropolises. Therefore, they just look at them as objects for and means for their own development. And they promised to these former colony, colonies uh, that they could develop and become as developed as the metropolises if they follow their rules, if they follow their process, if they uh, join this unequal exchange system that never really fulfilled their promise. <laughs> The colonizers, the colonized never reached the point because once they reached the same level as promised uh, in some years ago, the developed uh, countries, the developed nation, the metropolis was already more developed and they had new uh, products to sell. And this dependence relationship has been analyzed by uh, some sociologists and economists and they denounced how um, Colonization led to this condition of underdevelopment, of uh, eternal underdevelopment. Uh, at the beginning, at the middle of uh, the 20th century, uh, this development uh, discourse uh, was uh, rose to the fore because a lot of uh, African countries, they and, and Asian countries, they declared independence from uh, the Europeans' uh, metropolises. 
and then they as soon as they become independent from a uh, political standpoint they become dependent from economic standpoint and also from cultural standpoint and development discourse the notion of you can still achieve development even if you are not being under the hold of a colony uh, became a common place and design was really important uh, on supporting this ideology this discourse and also the practices associated for example um, bringing uh, some um, uh, aesthetic canons from Europe to uh, these countries and having the, um, some kind of adaptation to uh, conditions of development so that some uh, design started to be done and uh, developed and created in these countries but following the rules uh, but following the canons of the developed countries uh, beginning of the 60s uh, 1960s a lot of design schools have been installed and created in countries like in Brazil and they have been very influential uh, up to now once uh, uh, some researchers uh, around the, the globe started to question those aesthetic canons those uh, environmental relationships that the modern design uh, developed in Europe had with uh, the, the, the nature and the relationship with society this uh, movement of decolonizing design includes questioning those uh, aesthetic modern uh, western canons and um, seeing that the relationship to nature that is at the essence of this existential uh, project uh, the modern existential project uh, should not be seen as antagonism instead of seeing man as though as though being that has received uh, nature from God to exploit to use to handle and to transform into wealth uh, decolonizing uh, uh, discourses and criticism they uh, show that indigenous communities that um, even those that have been growing from the mix between different cultures um, put together because of colonization especially forced for example black people that were moved uh, by uh, force to become enslaved uh, in Latin America those cultures they still resisted this modern canon and they uh, had a much more uh, integrated relationship with nature assuming that human beings are part of nature not separate from nature so if you start from this uh, perspective then you get a different epistemology a new different way of understanding learning about the world and also a different methodology a different way of changing transforming the world in terms of uh, design research that means rebooting <laughs> all the major cornerstones of what we believe to be right to be good to be nice design and if we start from uh, an epistemologies of the south those epistemologies that uh, propose to rethink the way we see our relationship to our world like I was saying then we can end up with new designs of the South which is a movement also related to decolonizing design uh, which is, tries to emphasize recognize and overvalue uh, the undervalued uh, designs uh, that have, have been practiced and developed across generations in these former colonies and sometimes those designs are not exactly called designs by indigenous peoples or by the quilombolas or by the uh, other nations and uh, social groups that produce uh, products that produce services that create things and transform our world sometimes they might call it our craftsmanship sometimes they might call it something else but still this, this notion of uh, other designs uh, this notion of um, these Sorbons uh, designed by other names with other names uh, developed by uh, Alfredo Gutierrez Borrero has been very interesting to uh, uh, criticize and scrutinize uh, the designs that come from the north but also at the same time develop and stimulate uh, design otherwise designed by other epistemologies by other methodologies by other commercial frameworks and I have been studying especially the work of a Brazilian philosopher called Álvaro Vieira Pinto uh, he has been a master of Paulo Freire which is much more widely known Paulo Freire uh, wrote a lot about the conscientization the, the role of consciousness in becoming in, in engaging with the reality and transforming the reality by understanding the oppression 
that uh, affects that reality, that does not let the oppressed understand reality as in full potential, so that does not let the oppressed develop to the full potential and become a, a full human being. That's how oppression works. And conscientization, according to Paulo Freire, is the way to get out of oppression. This concept was developed based on the a uh, former concept by uh, Alvaro Vieira Pinto called uh, critical consciousness and uh, Alvaro Vieira Pinto developed uh, this critical consciousness uh, as a means to uh, criticize the development discourse that has been very strong at the time of his writings in the 1950s and 1960s and that proposed and promised uh, to nations like Brazil that they could just develop if they had the proper tools the proper uh, industrial um, settings so that they can could develop by their own uh, way. However, Vira, for Vieira Pinto, in his view, you needed also consciousness of these tools. A critical consciousness was essential. If you used the master tools uh, to develop the, um, uh, the slave, that wouldn't work because the master tools is configured to favor the master. Uh, the slave would always be tied to the master concept of the world and uh, the values if he keeps using the, um, the master tools in the same way as the uh, master wanted. Vieira Pinto proposed that instead we should appropriate, transform and change master tools for our purpose, redefine the purpose of the tools and the technologies and develop new technologies based on uh, our own uh, conception of reality. That means Critical consciousness means this process of understanding where these tools came from and pulling the thread of years and years and centuries of uh, domination and unequal um, exchange relationships. So, Alvira Pinto also speaks of collective existential projects, which is a very important concept to understand where does this uh, uh, development fit in terms of um, being human in a society. Development is, according to him, um, an interesting concept if we think that uh, it can lead towards different purpose, different projects that uh, societies develop. Instead of following the modern, modern project that has been pioneered and imposed to the most of the world by Europe, we could follow our own collective existential projects based on different values, based on different epistemologies and also methodologies. Alvaro Vira Pinto has dedicated his life and he was persecuted by the Brazilian military and, and the dictatorship and he had to flee to Chile and he had come back and his, most of his writings are not yet uh, understood, uh, studied and even published because of this persecution that was very strong in his case. And Alvaro Vieira Pinto has a lot of interesting um, uh, insights that can uh, help us to decolonize design research. For example, he says that decolonization is not just a process of destroying what has been already left by the, uh, the colonizers and not just a process of um, learning something new. You also need to lose <laughs> what you have learned that is wrong. Uh, you have to deal with the historical contradictions and you cannot just start an independent country if you do not uh, criticize the history of your own uh, being and, and try to scrutinize what are you doing that are still uh, oriented and beneficial to the metropolis even if you are independent from a, stand, uh, a political standpoint like Brazil was in the 20th century. Brazil. Uh, declared uh, political independence in the 19th century. However, uh, the, the metropolitanism, as he called, is still with us. So Brazil is still very much oriented to importing ideas, importing products, importing services, and uh, living in an existential project that is dependent from another existential project. And sometimes these existential projects, they can uh, coalesce, they can converge towards a single uh, object or goal and they can still enrich each other but sometimes and most of the times the existential projects of uh, the colonizers or the former colonizers they um, only can be realized if the existential projects of the colonized 
of the colonies, the farming colonies, they are destroyed, they are damaged, they are interrupted, they are not funded, they are spoiled in some way. And this mutually exclusive conflict is the thing that uh, Vera Pinto wants to address uh, through struggle, through work, through creative uh, change of the reality. And that goes through, as I said, critical consciousness. Well, almost 40 years of trying to develop in a, uh, following the same path of developed countries in Brazil in an accelerated way, now we came to the point where sustainable development is becoming the new deal with uh, developing countries. So we don't uh, have these politicians, uh, international politics, the geopolitics is not focused so much on the imperialism and colonialism relationship in an explicit way. But now we speak a lot about sustainable development, and how nations should cooperate, collaborate, especially Brazil, which is according to developed countries not collaborating on preserving, for example, the Amazon forest and other resources. However, this is still a coloniality, a colonial relationship that uh, sometimes we are not being critical enough to, um, uh, to problematize and see that the roots of the problem of unsustainability is not necessarily uh, the, the common emissions that we are making right now, but the mentality and the principles, the philosophical principles, the, uh, the practices that started from colonization. I mean, the relationship between humans and nature in an antagonistic way, as I said. So we have to change from the, the, the roots of the problem instead of just uh, trying to attack the um, symptoms. If we just keep uh, trying to do sustainable development uh, and developing design that way, so we will keep this relationship, this colonial relationship and the natural extractivist relationship. So we will not reach sustainability because by the time we develop in a sustainable way, we already have uh, exploited nature in a, in a way that benefits just a few. And the whole uh, issue right now is that because of sustainable development, uh, these developed countries, they seem to become more sustainable at the expense of the unsustainability in other parts of the world. If we just look at uh, sustainable development from uh, each nation alone, we cannot really figure it out because uh, it's not how it works. <laughs> uh, nature is whole, right? It's the whole uh, world that is interconnected. The nations are just created by humans to make sense of some political issues. And if we are really want to understand nature and the environmental crisis that we are creating, we have to see as a whole. And if you see as a whole, you see that a lot of uh, people are claiming to be sustainable and transitioning to sustainable energy in, uh, for example, in countries in Europe, they have these nice solar panels, they have these nice uh, wind turbines. However, it seems like they have zero carbon emissions to generate that energy. But there is an environmental impact which is really profound and strong. Uh, the places where the minerals uh, were extracted to build those tools that uh, apparently seems to be sustainable. If these minerals keep being exploited, extracted, and uh, in that, that way, that includes also social uh, impact, for example, through extreme work exploitation, bearing the the coming close to a slavery situation. If we keep doing this, how could we say it is sustainable development? It's just uh, uh, hiding the negative externalities, as the, econ uh, the economist says. But from the from the perspectives of the former colonies, this is not negative externality because it's something that is internal to our countries, our nations, and we could not say that this is an uh, external, external, ex, uh, external, external uh, phenomenon. It's internal, it's home affairs, and we have to deal with that. And therefore, we need to keep our hold on this epistemology of the South, because they are the ones that can really uh, uh, reboot this whole uh, thing. And then I can now mention, for example, a lot of interesting concepts that have been developed uh, or um, that have been 
recognized and worked uh, further by the modernity coloniality group in Latin America, for example, the work of uh, Mignolo, Quijano, uh, de Souza de Santos, and Escobar. They uh, denounce this coloniality of being, coloniality of knowing, coloniality of power, but they just didn't only deny, uh, denounced, but they also announced uh, other ways of relating to nature, for example, Summa Causae, um, which is translated as uh, Buen Vivi. Uh, they also uh, talk about Ubuntu, they talk about uh, our mama, anthropophagy, and many other ways of uh, relating to the world that is, is much more um, in tune with the uh, way nature works and the way nature um, become conscious of itself through the human being. So human are not outside of nature, they are part, the conscious part of nature, therefore they have a responsibility to take care of the nature. Those indigenous peoples that lived in, in America, in America as a whole, they knew this uh, from their birth. They had this 500 years ago. They were much more advanced in terms of their relationship to nature. If you could say they were much more sustainable, although their relationship to nature was not conceived in terms of sustainability, not in terms of um, exploitation, not in terms of extracting wealth, they had a different way of relating to the world. And those concepts that the modernity coloniality group has been putting forward has been very influential on looking at other ways of relating um, to uh, our world. And I would like to discuss one of these concepts that became very influential after the work of uh, Arthur Escobar and his book on designs for the pluriverse. So Arthur Escobar was one of these anthropologists uh, from the moder modernity coloniality group that became interested in design research and he wrote uh, some uh, articles and then a book about it. In, th in his book, uh, he defines the pluriverse as this concept of a world that can fit many worlds following the Zapatista uh, motto used in the Zapatista in the, in the uh, wars that liberated uh, Guatemala, Nicaragua and other countries from the Caribbean area. And the Zapatista movement was really about um, coexistence of different cultures, each in their own world, because uh, it must not just one world, there are multiple perspectives. If you uh, would say that all the perspectives are valid, that they are human perspectives about the world, you could say that there are multiple worlds because each perspective will lead you to a different world, a different cosmovision, a different uh, way of being in the world, and a, a different even a way of conceiving what you are and, and what you are around you. That's why Gutierrez Borrero says that there are also uh, other things that are not worlds that should also be accommodated in the concept of pluriverse. My uh, issue about this concept of pluriverse is that sometimes um, the design researchers inspired by this concept, they just would strive to focus on specific situations uh, and avoid generalizing, avoid creating uh, uh, more products or services that can be universalized and shared with other places. So they really focus on uh, tailor-made uh, designs for specific uh, worlds. Uh, however, I think that this is still the coloniality of knowledge uh, affecting the way we conceive the decoloniality of knowledge. We need to take out of this um, notion that we cannot universalize our knowledge from the epistemologies of the South. For example, if you say that Sumaco Sai or the Bon Vivi cannot be applied to other places in the world, in the South, so what's the point of engaging to South to South corporations? What's the point of joining forces to fight the epistemology of the North, to fight the modernity project and create new opportunities for developing different ways? I believe that following Alvaro Vieira Pinto, that denying the possibility of uh, universalizing, universalizing knowledge from the South, from uh, former colonies, is part of the uh, coloniality of knowledge. And we have to, therefore, uh, think other ways of uh, relating to our knowledge that we can also theorize and abstract ideas and develop them to the point that they become general theories that can 
provide general ways of uh, designing uh, services, products, and things that are not products and services that might be also important for our collective existential projects. Therefore, I redefine the pluriverse as uh, a, a universe that uh, where many universes, they compete for defining that reality. So uh, sometimes there are some conflicts uh, between these uh, universes, but these are conflicts that can be handled. They are not mutually exclusive conflicts. If sometimes one universe wants to destroy another universe, for example, they are not possible to coexist, then there should be sure, for sure an intervention that tries to avoid such a destruction. We cannot uh, allow, for example, the existence of all kinds of uh, human worlds because, for example, the fascist world is not a world that would allow other worlds to exist and this world should be fought. So we cannot just welcome everyone and think that this is, will be peaceful coexistence. It won't. We need to think about the pluriverse as a struggle, a decolonizing struggle, as the Zapatista thought from the beginning. So, uh, to summarize my, my short talk, we need to decolonize design research to open up the possibility for the pluriverse and other epistemologies of the South to emerge in this field. However, the point of this is not to decolonize design research uh, done in the metropolises, in the global north, so it become, becomes more uh, efficient or it becomes more welcoming for different cultures, for differences, so it becomes better. No, it's about improving uh, and recognizing and strengthening the design research that is done elsewhere and sometimes it's not done under the rubric of design, as uh, Boreto mentions in this concept of Diseños Otros, uh, other design by other names, and the uh, Equi Altervalentes, which means something which is similar in other society that plays a, diff a similar role, but ontologically is completely different story. And by uh, looking at the colonization, at the historical roots of this modern uh, collective existential project that, we, that is uh, hegemonic in the world, we can criticize this and we can uh, see in the new pathways for uh, coexisting in a, in a world, uh, in, a relationship, in our relationship with nature that is not antagonistic but is perhaps agonistic in a way that we see that there are differences between our culture, differences between our natures, but then we still can work together, we still can build things together, we still can coexist and we still can enrich each other and, and by uh, sometimes going through conflicts that uh, will change our, our ways of seeing the world, we transform and we become much more attuned to our differences in a democratic way. So decolonized design research towards the pluriverse is all about um, living in a society that where differences are positive, they are not uh, negative. It's not just about uh, equalizing everyone into their, each on their own places and these differences staying uh, 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 in a safe distance from each other, but instead it's about these differences to create uh, some friction and interchange in a in a dialogue that will provide alterity relationships that are uh, enriching and that can contribute to development of many cultures.